All right, so today's webinar, the topic is Google Forms, obviously. So um, Google Forms has always been one of the most useful apps, in my opinion, within the Google suite. There's a lot of different things that you can do with it. Um, and especially within the context of distance learning, there's, there's, there's a, a host of things that you can use, use it for in your class. Um, on the main screen here, I've got kind of the two biggest applications, surveys and quizzes. But uh, throughout the webinar today, we'll talk about some other uses for it as well. And, and um, towards the end, I've kind of handpicked four specific use cases for teachers in the classroom. And uh, hopefully one or more of those will apply to your particular class and uh, you can go through the process of creating your forms. So um, our agenda for today, we'll talk first of all about what it is. Second of all, we'll look at how you can access it and a couple different ways to do that. Um, third, we will talk about how to navigate around Google Forms, how to use the different question types and so forth. Fourth, we're going to look at, as a teacher, how you can use it. And then finally, we'll look at some, some questions maybe you have about it and some next steps for you in terms of additional training or additional supports that you may need on your end. So um, first of all, what is Google Forms? Well, Google Forms is part of the core Google Suite. Um, and at its, at its core, it's built on uh, allowing you to create surveys and quizzes, as I mentioned before. Um, one of the great things that you can do with the quizzes feature, um, especially since it's integrated natively into Google Classroom, is you can create self-grading quizzes where once you've set it up with an answer key, the students on their end can complete the quiz. There's a couple things that have to be true about it in order for it to be self-grading, uh, which we'll go into more detail later. But once the student on his or her end completes the quiz, it will compare the answers that they submit to an answer key that you create, and then it will automatically grade it and then submit it back to them with their grade. You can also configure it to take those grades that have been uh, allocated to that particular quiz and import them into Google Classroom so that it will add it to your grade book there, and there's not really anything else on your end that you need to do. So it's really efficient. It's relatively simple to set up. And for quick checks for understanding and you know, weekly quizzes that you may want to assign to your classes, Google Forms is gonna be a really powerful tool in that particular use case. Um, something else that you can do with it as well, you can look at student responses in the Google Form itself, or you can export student responses into a Google Sheet or a Google Spreadsheet. What that will enable you to do is filter and sort and do any of those things that you want you could or would want to do in a spreadsheet um, to kind of uh, better view your data and better analyze your data and, and use it to drive next steps for your instruction. So a couple different ways on how you can access Google Forms. For me, typically when I'm creating a Google Form and I'm just maybe want to send it out to parents or I want to send it out to other teachers and I'm trying to collect information for a particular thing, I'm going to access that through Google Drive directly. So over on the right hand side of this slide, I say that this particular method is the best method for creating a Google form in advance. Um, in your Google Drive, and again, there's multiple ways that you can get there, but let's just go to the waffle and I'm gonna head over to Drive. Anytime you wanna create one of the G Suite or Google Suite uh, document types, there's always gonna be in Drive that new button over on the left-hand side. Once you're there, you could use this menu to create folders to organize things in Drive, which many of you have done, or you could create a new Google Doc, a new Google Sheet, a new Google Slide, and if you hit more, there's gonna be the Google Forms option. So I could, if I wanted to, create a new Google Form here, send it to parents, send it to my coworkers, maybe add it to Google Classroom, but this is not necessarily the best way to add something to Google Classroom. So we'll talk more about that in just a second. So that's one way. Go to Google Drive, create a Google Form, and you're ready to go from there. Method number two, you can use the waffle directly. So anytime you open up a new tab page in Google Chrome, or if you're on your email or you're already in a Google app, there will be the waffle there. That's that three by three grid that's at the top right of the screen typically. 
One of the apps that's available there will be Google Forms. So just to kind of walk you through that, let's close out of my drive here. Let's close out of some of these. So I'm on my new tab screen. The waffle is gonna be up here at the top right. We can scroll down. It won't typically be in that list of, of kind of core Google apps. This is Calendar, Gmail, uh, Drive. But if you scroll down to the next section, you're gonna see Google Forms right there. So again, that's an alternate way that you can get into Google Forms. A third way is if you want to, in Google Classroom directly, and this is for those of you that, that use Google Classroom with your, with your class, in Google Classroom directly, when you're hitting that Create button, remember there's a couple different types of things that you can create in Google Classroom, an assignment, a question, a material. One of them is a quiz assignment. This is if you wanted to submit it to the class that you're in and you want your students to take it. So again, three different use cases. The first method, go to Google Drive if you want to create it in advance. Go to the waffle just for general usage. And if you want it to be something specifically in the class that you're teaching, do it from Google Classroom, create quiz assignment. All right, so those are kind of our three big ways of accessing it. Next, let's talk about how we're going to create our form. So when you get into Google Forms, let's open a blank one up so you can see what that looks like. When you get into Google Forms, you're going to see a blank form and it's gonna look like this. So it's gonna start out like all Google Documents calling it untitled whatever, and in this case, it's untitled form. Then you've got a space here for questions. Just to kind of walk you through the interface a little bit, top left, just like in a Google Doc and a Google Slide and Google Sheet, this is where you're going to name it. So let's call mine webinar sample form. You'll notice once I'm typing it in here, if I were to then click down over here, it's gonna copy the name of my form from this to this. So this is the file name. This is the page name. You can have multiple pages in a Google form. For the one that we're creating today, we're just gonna have a single, a single page. So that's the name of my form, and there it is there. If you look over on the right-hand side, this is gonna be the floating menu of things that you can add to your, to your form. I call it floating because as you add more things to your form, this menu will continue to kind of push up and down depending on which part of the screen you're looking at at that particular moment. We'll talk more about that in just a second. In the center of the screen, you have two tabs, and this is super important. The left-hand tab says questions. The right-hand tab says responses. When you're building your form, you wanna do that from the questions tab. This is where you add your questions, you add your uh, your pictures, whatever you want to add to the actual form itself is going to be on the questions tab. The second tab will only be useful to you once you have some respondees who have actually opened up your form, responded to it, and submitted their responses. Right now, you can see in this form, I have just responses. If some students or other users have completed the form, there will be a little notification bubble next to this indicating X number of people have submitted an answer to this particular form. So that's kind of a nice visual way that you can look at a form and see, okay, how many people have responded? Are there responses? And it's also kind of a visual indication of, are you in the right form? You added it to your classroom. If you, if you, you know for a fact that your students answered it and you're not seeing any responses here, it's most likely that you're not in the correct form that you set to your class, okay? So that's questions, responses. Those are the two main sections. You can see questions, you can see responses. Top right, there's a couple of interesting things here, and, and I'm just gonna kind of walk you through best practice in how you want to set these up. The first button here is for add-ons. That's more of an advanced feature. We're not gonna go into too much detail with that today but there are some add-ons that you can add into Google Forms which will set a time limit for your form. So if you wanted to do a timed quiz for your class and students only have 30 minutes, you would need to do that via an add-on. Add-ons are free, but 
Um, some of them are a little bit clunky and, and convoluted to configure on the back end. I can give you some best practice suggestions for add-ons that I like, but just know that that's more of an advanced feature. And for those of you just getting into forms, you're not going to find a lot of use out of that. The second button here is going to allow you to customize your theme. By default, it picks this kind of generic purple color. But if you click on that button, there's going to be some options here. So you can go through and choose. Generally, when I'm creating my forms for individual school sites, I'll kind of click something that's similar to their school colors. If I'm doing the high school, I might do an orange. If I'm doing Monterey Hills, I might do a green. I kind of choose something that's based on the color. Um, if you, you can also add your own custom images. So up at the top, there's a header option with the option to choose image. There's a bunch of them for you to choose from. So they're sorted over on the left-hand side. There's work in school, there's illustrations. We've got some lovely, timely uh, St. Patrick's Day things here. You've got travel. Some of them are even animated, which is kind of nice. You can see this one. It might be hard to see on your end. Let's zoom in. You can see that it's a little animated kind of bubbling stream. Kind of cool. Um, I typically don't use a lot of these ones. I prefer just the colors. It's a little bit more of a clean look. If at any point you want to upload your own image, you could just grab a picture of your gigantic head blown up and make that the header. That's certainly an option. You can do a photo of your class, whatever you want to do. You can see here when I'm clicking on photos, this is pulling from Google Photos, or you could just upload one automatically. Um, those are all options for you there. So I would recommend once you're building your form, you name it, you choose your theme, and then the third step in the initial setup is configuring a couple different options. And we're gonna do that from this cog or settings option here. This is the same button that's in Google Classroom. So let's click it and let's take a look at some of these things here. Um, when you, one of the biggest issues that has come up in the past two weeks of people that are using Google Forms is teachers want to create a form. They're very happy about the questions that they've created. They've sent it to their students. Their students have responded to it and they're feeling really happy. However, they don't click this first box and it's very important to click this box. When students are submitting their responses to a Google Form, unless you're explicitly asking them for their name, like you could for the first part in question number one, say, what's your first name or what's your first and last name? When they turn it in, if you don't click this box, there will be no indication of who submitted what answers to the form. If, however, you do turn this on, in the back end, when students are completing their form, it will automatically collect who it was that submitted the form. So best practice here, I always, always, always leave this option turned on. Secondly, here's an option for restricting this form to users in South Pasadena. If you want to use Google Forms to, to uh, ask questions to your parent community, like for example, a lot of teachers sent out a survey through Google Forms to their parents asking them what technology they had at home. They wanted to know, do you have a Chromebook, a MacBook, a Mac, a PC? Do you have a printer? Do you have an iPad? Do you have a, whatever the case may be. If you have this option turned on and it's on by default, when you send it to those parents, they're not in the South Pasadena domain. So when they open it up, they won't be able to access it. So just think carefully about what is the population? Who are the stakeholders that you want to send your form to? If it's outside, if it's parents, if it's, you know, if you're a Girl Scout troop leader and you want to send it to the other Girl Scout parents, you're going to want to make sure that this option is turned off. If it's your students, leave it on because that helps ensure that their data uh, is protected and their privacy is protected. Okay, so just think about that prior to to sending out your form. The next option, limit one response. Generally speaking, especially if it's a quiz, you're gonna to wanna to turn that option on. That means your, your Google form won't get blasted with 7,000 responses where kids maybe took a quiz, they didn't like their, answer, their, their, their grade and they submit it again, submit it again, submit it again. Typically, again, you wanna keep this on for most use cases. Um, then there's a couple options here that are more optional. You can choose, do you want students to be able to edit their form after they submit it? Let's say they took a quiz 
or they're answering a survey and they realize, oh, I need to add a little bit more to my answer here. Sometimes you may want to have that turned on so that they can continue working on it even if they've submitted it. So on their end, what they'll see is an edit button that will allow them to go back into the, into the quiz or survey and continue editing it uh, as though they're taking it for the first time. I'm going to turn that on. Um, see summary charts and text responses. I typically leave that off. We're not going to belabor that point. Up at the top, a couple other things. So this is the presentation settings. Progress bar only applies if when you set up your form, you set it up so that it's multiple pages. You've probably taken surveys through SurveyMonkey or Google Forms before where there's a page of questions and then there's a next button at the bottom. Then there's another page of questions and then there's a next button at the bottom. Progress bar will tell you they're 33% done or 50% done as they're clicking through those. Most of the time, you don't really need to keep that on, especially if you're new to Google Forms. Don't worry about it. The second option here, shuffle question order. So this is nice if you want to randomize your quiz a little bit. Typically when you're in a classroom environment and students are working on the quiz simultaneously on multiple diff different devices, you want to turn that on because then it will prevent students from just looking over each other's shoulders and seeing exactly where I am on the form matches with my neighbor and so I can just copy their answers. But since we're not really in that environment anymore, I'm going to turn that off. The final option here says confirmation message. This is the text that shows up on the student side once, they're, uh, once they've turned in their quiz or survey. By default, it's gonna say your response has been recorded. You can customize it if you want to and say, Mr. Brian appreciates the time and effort you put into your quiz. Nice. Again, doesn't have to, you don't have to do that, but that's kind of a nice little personalized touch. The third option here is for quizzes. When you first create a Google form, it's not going to be a quiz. The biggest difference is if it's not a quiz, it's just a survey where you're collecting information. You, there's no grading, there's no answer key. As soon as you turn this on to make something a quiz, it will enable answer key and it will enable you to grade something. Okay, so again, depending on use case, you can turn that on or off. For now, I'm gonna turn that off and I'll walk you through quiz a little bit later and hit save. All right, so notice some text has changed here. I turned on that option to collect username, to collect email addresses. It's gonna give me a reminder here that that's the case. This form is automatically collecting email addresses for South Pasadena Unified School District users. That's correct, that's what I want. All right, so now over on the right-hand side, these are all the different types of options for adding particular questions to your survey or your quiz. So I'm gonna click on here where it says untitled question. And again, just best practice, I would recommend collecting their names in some way. So you could do your name. You're noticing as you type in stuff here, it's going to use its uh, machine learning to detect what type of answer would be most appropriate for that type of question. By default, that said multiple choice. As soon as I typed in your name here for the question, it changed it to short answer. It's detecting all automatically that if I'm asking for a student name, multiple choice is not gonna be an appropriate type there. So I'm gonna do short answer instead. Let's make it required. By default, this is always gonna be turned off. Make sure that you turn it on for most use cases. If you're asking an opinion about something, what did you think about this? Maybe it might be okay to make it not required, but in most cases, you wanna make it required. One of the buttons at the top that we skipped over when we were talking about these buttons was the eye. This is a really great tool to use when you're creating your forms. Putting my mouse over this, you can see a dialog box that says preview. When I click on this, it's going to open up in a new tab the form that I'm working on, and it will let me see it as though I'm a student and taking this particular survey. So every once in a while, generally when I'm building my forms, I'll add a couple of questions, click on the I, preview it, just to make sure the look and feel is good, the grammar is fine, um, and everything is copacetic on my end. It just gives me a better view of what the students are gonna see because it's there's a not exact parity between what I'm creating here and what the students will see on their end. It's a little bit different in terms of 
the structure of things and the placement of things. All right, so there's my first question, collecting their name. Over on the right-hand side, again, that floating menu, it's gonna move around as we're adding more questions. I'm gonna click on the button here to add question, and it's gonna start with my next question. So let's do just a simple one, two plus two equals. Let's do multiple choice, and I'm gonna give them some options. So let's do two. I'm gonna hit enter on my keyboard to add another response. Three, four, and five. So these can be my, my responses here. I'm gonna make it required. And you can see, again, this is off by default. Let's hit that preview button again to jump back in. My name, there's my multiple choice. Notice if I skip over a question, the reason I wanna make it required is because if I don't, they can submit it and without a response and we don't want that to be the case. It's gonna give them some error text here that says this is a required question. And then once they fill that in, they can submit it. The other thing that you can do from that preview screen is you can actually take your survey or your quiz as though you are one of the stakeholders. Notice how when we looked at responses before, there was nothing next to it. There's a little notification bubble there now that's indicating one person, in the case me, has taken this particular survey. You can continue adding questions as you go. There's other types of content that you can add over here. Importing questions will allow you to grab from other Google Forms. Title and description, you can separate your questions into different sections by changing the title here. You can do uh, an image. So if you wanted to give them an image, uh, if you're an art teacher, for example, I know Sarit is here, um, you could do a, a picture of some famous painting and then for a question, ask them who painted it or if you wanted to ask them their opinion of it, you know, what do you think about it? What, what's, what's your opinion about the line and the, the shading, whatever. You could, get, you could give them a question and you could ask, or sorry, you could give them a picture and ask them a question that's relative to it. Another thing you can do here is add a video. So kind of the same thing. You can add a video from YouTube. Let's search for um, Crash Course. Let's do Plato and Aristotle, sure. So it's gonna add a video there. Let's do Crash Course Video. Then below that, you can add another question. And let's say, after watching the video above, write what you learned about Plato. Right? And notice again, before it was multiple choice here, it's detecting now the most appropriate type of answer for this is gonna be paragraph text, which is longer text form. Let's make it required again. Um, a couple other things that you can do while we're kind of in the, in the uh, creation process, if you wanna resort things, you'll notice that there's a little handle up at the top. It kind of looks like a two by three grid, almost like a waffle. Um, if you put your mouse on top of that, it's gonna change your cursor to that uh, multi-directional arrow. Clicking and dragging is going to allow you to resort things however you decide. If at any point you want to delete a question, right now this is a blank question. I don't really need this. I'm going to delete it. There's another option as well for duplicating. If you wanted to set up a really complex question type and duplicate it and just change the numbers. So let's say this one's two plus two equals. Let's add another one. Three plus two equals. I just basically duplicated it and it also keeps that required option configured since I set that on the original one when I duplicated it. Let's hit preview again. Oh, remember I said I only one response. Let's go back and, and correct that real quick. So again, here's my form. There's my question. There's my second question. There's my video that I can watch. And when I watch it, it's just embedded right here. So they don't have to go out to a new tab, which is really handy. And then they can fill in their answer here and then hit submit. Okay, so that's kind of the creation process. In the, in the slide deck that I'm gonna share with you guys later today, I kind of walk you through each of those things that we talked about, renaming, customizing your questions, adding questions, adding titles. Um, that'll be there for you as a reference, but I just wanted to kind of walk you through a, a very 
quick and dirty way of, of going through and creating a form. Settings we talked about, um, responses. So let's take a look at responses real quick. Let me turn in another one here. Let's do Alicia, let's do this and this. Submit. So you'll notice now I have two responses. Once I'm there, the responses screen is gonna look like this. So you got a couple things going on here. First of all, it's gonna tell me because I collected email addresses, who has responded. So in this case, it's me twice. But there's a couple different tabs here that we'll walk through. Summary is just gonna give you an overview of all student responses and it generates a graph based on that information. So a little pie chart here. You could go for question analysis. So let's go for, I wanna just look at answers for my two plus two equals. It'll show me different responses from the student side. The most useful one, especially if you're doing it as a quiz, is gonna be this individual tab. You're gonna navigate between student submissions with this arrow, or you can select individual students here. And then you can go down and see their answers to the, to the quiz or survey by individual submission. All right, and again, you can navigate back and forth here. If at any point you wanted to generate a spreadsheet from the responses, you're gonna use this button. Let's click it for a second, create a new spreadsheet. And it will generate a spreadsheet, it has timestamp of when they submitted it, email address, and then the questions are always gonna be at the top row, and then their answers are gonna be the subsequent rows. Okay. All right, so let's talk about a couple different use cases. So use case number one, again, is, is kind of the, the, the bread and butter of Google Forms, where you're creating a survey and you wanna collect information of some sort from an audience. So a couple different ideas here. Um, home technology questionnaire. So that's that example I mentioned earlier where you're sending a survey home to be completed by parents or students. What type of technology do you have at home? What type of rules for technology do you have at home? Any information that you wanna collect from them, you could use a survey for that. Option number two, collect and graph data using Google Sheets. So this would be a classroom application. For those of you that, um, especially in the elementary school, I know one of the, one of the activities that teachers like to do is um, they have a, a survey where students go around and ask their friends or ask other classes about you know, what's your favorite food? What's your favorite sports team? Whatever type of information they wanna collect. Typically they would might do that by hand and answer the survey by hand. They could do that here and, and you could use the tools in Google Sheets to, um, to generate graphs and charts so that you're getting those math standards uh, for those students. Finally, number three, a student interest or learning style inventory. This is something that when I was a classroom teacher, I would always do at the beginning of the year. I'd create a survey that I, that I created, uh, share a survey that I created where I'm asking, um, what's your learning style? Are you a visual learner? Are you a, a auditory learner, kinesthetic, whatever? And then I would walk them through um, a couple different questions about that. And that let me know a little bit more about my students so that I could try to integrate those things better into my, in, into my teaching practice. I might ask them what their favorite things are, um, you know, just to get a general uh, background information about students. Use case number two is a self grading quiz. So I'm gonna walk you through that right now, but again, the best way for you to create a self grading quiz is through Google Classroom directly. So let's go ahead and head there. Um, this is just my, my technology sandbox class. For those of you that are kind of tinkering around with things and you wanna do so in a low stakes environment, I would highly recommend creating a Google Classroom that is just your sandbox, where you can create stuff, play with things, see what it would look like on your end. Maybe I can give you the, uh, um, the dummy student that we have for the district um, where you can enroll them and you can sign in as them and see what things look like from the student side as well. Um, but let's create a quiz here. Let's do a quiz assignment. And let's do webinar quiz assignment. Open the Google form and complete the quiz. All right. So a couple things here when you're creating a quiz. 
these options are always going to be the same over on the right hand side. Let's make it out of, yeah, we'll do 100 is fine. Um, make sure you keep the option for grade importing turned on. Grade importing is going to allow you to take the grades that are, that are in the quiz itself and bring them back into Google Classroom. So you're not going to have to manually key them into some sort of grade book. It will do that for you. Another option here that's important to be mindful of is this locked mode. Locked mode on Chromebooks is great because it prevents students from opening up other tabs and potentially cheating on a quiz. However, we're not, there's no guarantee that all the students at home are working on Chromebooks. In fact, I'm, we know that they're not all working on Chromebooks and this only works on Chromebooks. So in a regular classroom environment, it would be okay to turn this on. For now, make sure you keep it off. All right, so let's go into my blank quiz. Now, a couple things are gonna be different. Remember that quiz option we talked about before, which was up, into set, up in settings, where you can make something a quiz? This one, since we created it as a quiz through Google Classroom, it will automatically turn this on. You're noticing up at the top right, there's a new section here that says total points. That's gonna be relevant in just a second. So let's name our quiz. Let's call it webinar quiz. And let's add a couple of questions. Let's use my, um, my simple math again. So let's do two plus two equals, and we'll add some choices, two, three, four, and five. Now, the important thing about when you're doing an, a, a quiz that you want to be automatically graded is you need to configure the answer key. If you don't set the answer key, it's not gonna know automatically what the answers to your questions are. So I've created a question. I'm making it required. Now I'm gonna to go to the answer key. Here you can, you can weight your questions in different ways. Let's make it one point. And here I can see two plus two equals. Well, the answer is four. Notice how when I click on that, it's gonna put a little green check next to it. That's the visual indication that this is the correct answer for that particular question. I'm gonna hit done. Okay, down at the bottom again, there's a little reminder. I do have an answer key. It's been uh, set to one point for this particular question. And again, this up at the top has been updated to show one point. I'm gonna create a new question. Let's do three plus three equals. Those are my choices. Let's make it required. Set an answer key, six, make it one point, done. Okay, so Auto grading works great for multiple choice. The other type of question that it works pretty well for is check boxes or drop down box. So these are basically, drop down is, is pretty much the same as multiple choice. It just looks a little bit different. Let's do check boxes. Uh, which of the following are the best type toppings? Anchovies. One thing that we didn't talk about before is you can add pictures to your forms as you're going. Notice how when I put my mouse on top of a particular um, answer or even up here, there's this little icon that appears. This is the add image icon, both in Google Docs and Google Forms and in anything else that's Google related. I can click on this. I can upload if I want to. I could take a picture with my camera, but most of the time I use the Google image search and let's search for anchovies. There we go. All right, let's go down to pepperoni. Let's search for pepperoni. Yeah, that's pretty good. Let's do and loading image. Let's give it a second. Let's try green peppers.
Okay, I didn't like that picture. Let's try another one. All right. So again, if I wanted to preview it and see what it looks like on the student side, that's what it will look like when you add the images. So it kind of sorts them in an array. Let's close out of that. All right, and let's set my answer key for this one. I'm pretty biased, so let's do two points on this one. I love anchovies, I love this. That's it, done. All right, and there's gonna be my question there. So that's been assigned. Let's close out of that for a second. All right, let's assign this to my students now. All right, now I'm gonna sign in as a student and show you what that looks like on their end. So <clears throat> here's the assignment that I just posted. Here's my webinar quiz, let's open it up. All right, and again, I'm signed in as a student here, so let's do the correct answer for this one, incorrect answer for this one, and let's do incorrect answer for this one. I'm gonna hit submit. You can either turn on or off the ability for students to see the score immediately after, but let's hit view score. All right, and that's gonna give me uh, a view of the questions that I answered, the incorrect answer that I chose with the correct answer underneath, and at the top, it will give me my score. So now jumping back over into the teacher view, I can see responses. Here's those, those graphs again. I can go to individual. I can see that one student took it. They got this one correct, this one wrong, and this one wrong. Okay, now notice here, you can see that there's a button that says release score. What that's gonna do is uh, once you have checked their scores, if you need to do hand grading, like if you're doing a, a mixed uh, format quiz where you've got some multiple choice and then some where students are actually typing out responses, um, you'd have to go in manually and hand grade those ones. But I'm gonna release this score. So you can add a message if you want to, let's release it. All right, and then on my end, and we'll have that. Uh, let's jump back over to the, to the student side for just a second. All right, um, one, one disconnect that I've found with uh, some teachers this week is how to best access the responses. Let me close out of this and head back to the main screen in uh, Google Classroom. So when people are trying to pull up student responses to that particular quiz, the easiest way for you to get there is not to go and try to find it in Google Drive or to go through some of those other methods that we've talked about for, for access. But the best way for you to get back into it is through Google Classroom directly. You already have the quiz added here as an assignment. If you click on the quiz itself, it's gonna actually take you into the student preview mode but down at the bottom right of the screen, you can see that there's a little pencil. This will take you back into the editing mode. If you click on this, I can see again, here's my form. I can add questions if I want to and head back over to my responses tab. Now, again, a lot of people were having trouble finding this again. Just make sure you're in Google Classroom, open up the quiz itself right there, and then click on that little pencil icon at the bottom right to edit the form and see student responses. Okay, so self-grading quizzes are great. They're pretty easy to set up. Just make sure that you do the answer key. Make sure you give your questions weight, how many points they're worth each. Um, typically, you want the point value here to match the point value in Google Classroom. So in other words, for mine, when I created it, there was a maximum value of four. 
right? My first one was worth one point, my second one was worth one point, and my other one was worth two points. You want the point value here to match the point value in your actual assignment. So let me go back over here and I'm gonna change my point value to four so that there's parity between the Google form itself that will be in, uh, exporting grades back into Google Classroom and the assignment here. You want those to be the same. Let's update. And if you accidentally make a mistake and you set the, the point values incorrectly, you can always go back and change that. All right, let's tidy up a couple things here. Okay, so that's one use case. Again, super easy. You can use it for vocabulary tests. You can use it for quick math, checks for understanding, a lot of different applications here. Um, but again, remember, it's multiple choice, it's drop down, and it's check boxes. Those are the types of responses that are the most easy to grade with, uh, with the auto grading function. Um, mixed format quiz. So we're going to take the one that we've already created and we're going to make it into a mixed format instead. So, and what I mean by mixed format is we've got some multiple choice and check boxes here. Let's add a third question and I'm going to move it down to the bottom. And let's ask a question about what day. No. Is the most interesting thing you've done recently. Okay. By default, again, it's going to recognize that it's a paragraph text. Let's make it required. Now, answer key for this one. There's going to be such a diverse range of student responses that it will be impossible for you to set an answer key. Therefore, it's going to require manual grading on your end. Let's make this a five pointer because they're typing in a little bit of a, short, a longer response here. Let's make it done. Now, if I preview it, those questions are the same, but let's go down to the bottom. So here, let's just fill in incorrectly. The most interesting thing I found recently is Okay, I'm gonna submit. <clears throat> Let's go back to the teacher view and I'm gonna go to responses, individual. This is the one that I just submitted, so it's gonna have my grades here. Got it wrong, got it wrong, got it wrong. Now here, it's not gonna auto grade. By default, it's gonna have a value of zero until you go in and hand grade this. So that's my response. I can simply click over here. Oh, that's a pretty thoughtful response. He answered in a complete sentence. Let's do a five. Okay, then I can release. And we're good to go. All right, so just be mindful of that. Now it's made this one correct. Be mindful of that. If, if you want something that's really efficient and really easy on your end, stick with the, uh, the auto grading. If you want something that is a little bit more of a depth of understanding, depth of learning, and you want students to write longer responses, that's totally fine. It's just gonna require uh, some extra steps on your end to make sure that they're getting um, grades for those and feedback for those. You could as well, while we're talking about feedback, you can give individualized feedback per student submission. So let's see here, I wanted to say, that's a good choice. But nope. You can also add um, video feedback here. So if, if it was, let's say it's a math quiz and they're getting that the same type of question wrong over and over again, you could bounce them out to a video that reteaches that same skill. It could even be a video that you've created where you're reteaching a skill and you can link them to that so that when they see it on their end, they'll see, yeah, I got it wrong, but oh, Mr. Bryant's providing me with a video here that will remediate whatever skills I'm lacking. Here I'm gonna put something like, great contribution, contribution, I am also playing that. All right. And there we go. So again, that's the biggest difference between something that auto grades and something that doesn't. You will have to manually go in, 
allocate a grade, give individual feedback if you want, but there is that additional step on your end in terms of grading. So that's the third. Um, the fourth one I just wanted to share, and this is not gonna apply to, to everyone, but the fourth one I thought was a really interesting idea. One of the middle school teachers at the beginning of our uh, distance learning program, she created a Google form that was an agreement form for the students to fill out, um, accepting some terms with, with regards to distance learning. So let me bounce into it and show you what it looks like. So she was collecting first name, last name, period number, science teacher from, from a drop down. Then there's some different things that she was requiring the students agree to. So for example, I will click the turn in or submit button for all assignments I create, I complete on Google Classroom, agree. I will click the turn in or submit button for all assignments I complete on da 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 da, I agree. There's a couple different things that they're at least reading through and kind of getting a big picture of what their digital classroom is gonna look like moving forward. And then at the very bottom, they, they typed in their name as a signature. So I thought that that was a really interesting idea. You could do something similar for behavior contracts or if there's students that you're meeting with on Zoom or Google Meet that are continuously breaking your expectations, you could have them uh, sign this particular document so that there's a little bit more accountability for what they're doing. Um, in, in your class. Again, not going to be appropriate for everyone, but I thought that that was a really interesting use case. Uh, Alicia put this here about importing grades to classroom. Alicia, do you want to talk a little bit about that yeah, since you have more of a classroom application than, than I have? Yeah, so basically when you post a quiz on Google Classroom, um, as Chad mentioned earlier, the best way to view it would be to actually open up the quiz um, and look at the responses. But when you're ready to import their grades, if you've gone through, if you've manually graded anything that requires that, if you've double checked and, and made sure that you're happy with the form and um, how student responses were, when you go back and open it on Google Classroom, you can see I put a purple box around something, import grades will be there. And you can just click that button and it'll automatically import their grades from the form onto classroom. So then from classroom, you can then import them onto Aries as well. So remember, we, remember we, we looked at that release, release scores option earlier. This is a single click and you can, you can import all the grades with, with one click, right? Just to clarify, you actually don't have to release the scores on the form in order to import them on Google Classroom right. as well. Yeah. Yep, thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. Um, so a couple last little things before we wrap things up for today. Um, I always like to talk about next steps for you. So there's a couple links here. Um, I refer back to that teacher center really often, but there's actually a great, um, page here specific to Google forms and they have one for each app within the G suite. But if you, um, Scroll down, there's gonna be some basics tutorials. It kind of goes through a lot of the stuff that I went to in detail uh, for, the, for this webinar today, but you can rewatch here. Of course, this webinar will be uploaded to YouTube afterwards. Um, you're, you're welcome to rewatch. There's some additional um, PDF lesson plans here that will talk to you about how to do specific things, how to upload questions, how to organize student data with sheets, how to use Bloom's taxonomy. And then there's, at the bottom, this is probably the most useful section of this page, there are teacher submitted videos on how to do various things within Google Forms, how to set up locked mode. Again, don't do that while we're at this particular juncture. Uh, how to customize, how to insert images. A lot of the things that we talked about today kind of really quickly, these short tutorials we're, we'll go into more detail about. So I found that this website is really useful. The second one here is uh, a complete video guide to Google Forms. A uh, teacher that I refer to pretty frequently is this, this uh, ed tech person named Alice Keeler. She's great. She explains things in a really easy, uh, slow, guided way. So I linked to her site that walks through some of the things with Google, Google Forms. And uh, for those of you that, that came and were to, to the webinar today and are a little bit more advanced, there's some extra credit options for you here. So add images to your forms add a collaborator. When we're talking about collaborators, this is if you want multiple people to have editing access of the same form, you need to add them as a collaborator. Just real quick walking you through that, because I imagine that this is going to be useful to most of you. 
Collaborators are available at the top of your Google form. If you go to the three dots menu, I often call that the snowman menu. There's an option here for adding collaborators. If I wanted Alicia to be a collaborator here, I could add her. If you just click on send, let me close out of that for one sec. If you just click on send up here, sending is how people will take the quiz or the survey if you don't use it through Google Classroom. If you wanna add a collaborator, remember collaborator access means they can edit it just like you edit it. It's kind of like sharing a Google Doc where you have multiple simultaneous access to it. That's how you're gonna have multiple people editing the document at the same time. Okay, that's collaborators. A couple other things for, for extra credit. Um, there's something called response validation. What that allows you to do is set criteria for, if it's an open-ended question, it, you can set it so it will only accept a single word or a single word of a certain length or a number between zero and 10. And if they don't submit an answer within that particular criteria, it'll give them an error message that said, this is not a valid answer. Definitely more of an advanced feature, but it's something that's useful in Google Forms. And then finally, you can add, try one of those uh, add-ons like Timeify Me. That's the one I, I referenced earlier where you can set a time limit for a quiz because by default, it's going to give them unlimited time to complete the quiz. Um, and again, those add-ons are available here at the top of a form. I've already added Timeify, but if you want to add a new one, you can go to add-ons here and there will be a library of add-ons that you'll see. If at any point you wanna try one and it's not available to you, you can send me an email. I have to whitelist it for you so that it's available to you. So there's a bunch of different ones here. If you click into any of them like form notifications, it will give you a description of what it does. So some advanced features, again, you don't have to get into those unless you're a little bit more comfortable with, with Google Forms. For now, I would just work on how to create a quiz, how to make it auto grade, how to send it out to your students. Those are the basics, cover those first.